this is Coffee Number 5. I'm your host, Lara Schmoisman. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Coffee Number 5. And today, oh my God, I'm so excited about this one because I'm going to talk about coffee, one of my passions. And so I invited Maria Palacio. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so much. I'm Uh, thrilled to be here. And I, you know, guys, how much I love to have another person with an accent. So you guys can <laughs> try to figure us out. And it's like, you have to listen and you have to listen with an accent. With I yes. know that sometimes it takes a minute to get used to. But welcome, uh, Maria. So I really want to know more about you because I am I know that you are the fifth generation in your family working with coffee. Yes. So how, I mean, first of all, it's hard to decide to go into the, were you bred to go into the, uh, in the business or it's something that it was your decision as an adult? No, it wasn't a a decision as an adult. I grew up in a coffee farm. My whole family, our coffee growers, like you mentioned, fifth generation from my mom's side, my dad's side. Um, But I, you know, I faced all those struggles Coffee is not very profitable. And if you see the coffee growing communities, they just fall into deep poverty loops. And so I was one of those that when I graduated, I was like, I want to do something completely different uh, because there's just no opportunities in my family. And so first I pursued my fashion career where I was working in New York for Marc Jacobs, Alexander Wang and so on. Um, And so later on, I went back to my roots. Well, that's super interesting. I mean, everyone who knows me knows that I love fashion and I am I would do marketing for the fashion industry. I used to teach for the fashion industry, but, uh, and I believe that fashion is so ahead of the game in so many things that it and makes all industries change really fast. And you can connect fashion with anything, honestly. Exactly, exactly. I think that's- in the same way, it's like, yeah. Yeah, that's why you see, like, we don't lunch, uh, we lunch collections of coffee. Yes, <laughs> so exactly. That's what I keep from my fashion background. <laughs> that's amazing. So let's talk a little bit about that, because I know how hard it is to get into a family business. And sometimes when you, you're the new blood and you come with all this experience and you... And being Latina, I know how hard it is to break into traditions many yes. times. And it's like, if it's working fine, why are you going to make something new? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I remember like, so I came to US and I didn't want to do anything with the farms for me, it just meant struggle. And, um, but when I was working in fashion, I mean, everybody drinks coffee and everybody's running in coffee. There's such a late night and quickly I realized that, you know, how big the coffee industry was. Second most consumed beverage in the world, people are drinking more cups of coffee um, and so on. And so I was like, well, hey, if it's such a profitable business, business why are we struggling back at home and so I started you know with my co-founder uh, John we started thinking about a sustainable coffee chain how it could be and there was a moment we we're like okay we figure out we have a model that it could work we came back to Colombia um, and they're like like you said well that's not how it's done you know 40 years and generations this is how it has been done you sell it to a cooperative there's already a model that works even my dad you know, he was like, no, 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 already have my model. And it took us really four years of knocking doors uh, in my own community. Finally, um, where a farmer from another town was like, okay, yes, I believe in what you guys are doing um, and I'll send you your coffee. But it was a journey of, for years, it was it's definitely a very male dominant uh, industry. So breaking through that was really difficult. Uh, but now they, I, 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 can am, I can imagine. And let me tell you a little secret. One of my dreams is to have a coffee shop one day. Oh, that's and I know that there are so many coffee shops out there. And like, and I come from the uh, culture that you meet for a cafecito. Something exactly. is part, it's some part of his social or like doing anything working with coffee or in my case also was uh, mate but yeah. it's like part, such a, sto- a strong part of who we are so even when I had to name my co- my podcast I had to who I am and I was I'm a cup of coffee after a cup of coffee that's what people know me for I always have a coffee on my hand so yeah. uh it's it's such a big part of the culture so you brought up a whole new idea about coffee and mostly in the United States because coffee is not such a 
a strong uh, heritage thing that as we have in Latin America. So we, you're not, and you're competing with huge brands. Yes. They are that, how would you even start? Yeah, so I know when we were first going to start here, it, and especially where I am in the Bay Area, it's such a credit market. Season. You have Ver Coffee, you have Red Bay Equator, and uh, Blue Bottle came from here. So um, we already had really strong competitors. But we start understanding and kind of looking at the shelf and what was being presented. And one thing that we noticed back then is that all packaging was brown. Everybody was uh, sharing and uh, voicing it out as we are the roasters and the roasters was being the rock stars. And the color palette was very much from a roaster perspective, which is the end result that they get, which is the roasted coffee. So all browns. And mm -hmm. if you go to the shelf, the shelf was very one color. There was no differentiator. And also you wouldn't see the farmer. And so that's where like we saw that opportunity. Like we could come from a farmer. We are farmers woman-led, farmer-led, and really bring our whole culture. You don't, you, in that time, you wouldn't see any colors in the shelf. Mm -hmm. um, you wouldn't see the picture of the farmer. And so we decided to go very unapologetically with our culture, with our colors. Um, and one of the things we say was like, okay, the picture of the farmer needs to come up front. And so suddenly like all of our packaging, you don't see it, but um, has the picture of the farmer, the colors, and um, they all have this, you know, here kind of. Yeah. Uh, and so they will start knowing us by the colorful company or the colorful branding. And I think those little things of speaking through the farmer and finding like those differentiators help us break through. Um, Because people didn't have connection to a farmer and suddenly they did. Um, so it was finding that uh, that differentiator that really helped us, you know, burst into the market. And, and how do you decide? Because this is one of the struggles that I talk to so many founders all the time that they are get lost in where should I go first? Should I go retail, consumer? What Because it takes a lot of work. Whatever you decide to go, whatever approach it takes a lot of work if you want to do it right. So yeah. how... How do you make the decision of what direction you're going to take and and how do you take it from there? Yeah. So I'm going to tell you a story of how we started because it will lead you to, the, but we started really small. And I remember when we were going to, I remember we like, I finally brought the coffee and I had the packaging, I have everything. And then it's like, oh crap, now I need to sell it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, I have all of these. I, we literally went on production because uh, my background was designed. So like, yeah, I was, we designed it, we produced it. And then uh, didn't have sales background. And so I remember my co-founder, he said like, find a niche, hit it hard and eventually it will spread, right? I, in that moment, I had a three month old baby and I had, I would, had recently moved to California to the Bay Area. And I realized there's this amazing group of moms that they will meet at parks. And so and I noticed that after the park, they will go and drink Starbucks because uh, there's this incredible housewife community or women or incredible moms that are in maternity leave from all the tech companies around here because I am here in the Silicon Valley area. And so I decided, well, this is the only community that I know. I will go every day. I'll set my tent, my table, and start serving them cafecito in the parks. I love what, it. <laughs> yes. What I didn't know is that I was creating a community uh, of followers. And who better that, that, you know, who makes the decisions at home mostly, you know, the woman is who makes most yeah, of the of course. Um, And so I realized I was having this really powerful community. Now, we... Our mission was to leave farmers out of poverty. So there was a moment that we start entering into retail because I, I was following this group of moms. So I noticed what supermarket they will go. So then I'll approach the supermarket and be like, hey, I already have a following. I know, you know, the people are coming to buy, the people that buy is, you know, they're coming to the supermarkets. We start entering into the small supermarkets in the area. And I'll just start following them. I remember like certain fashion brands. I, 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 I love what you're saying because I, I, I always say that the, my keyword of 2023 was community. It's all about creating community and in any kind of products, but also if you get too distracted as a small owner to try to, to first of all, do it yourself. When I Yesterday yeah. I was actually in, in a conference talking with a group of PCG uh, mm -hmm. women, uh, women in PCG. And what the, the talk was about uh, 
finding partners mm. and not only creating relationship for business. It's of course, it needs to be lucrative for everyone, but you want to find in that community, your partners and that creates more community. And mm. that seems that it's what you found with these small uh, businesses. Yes, exactly. Exactly. We create that, that community. Now, there was a point that uh, we went back to our mission. Okay, Our mission is to leave farmers out of 40. And so it's like, by one bag and by one, we're not going to leave farmers out of 40. And so there we made a conscious decision that that market was too small to reach our goal. And we noticed that their husband or they were in maternity leaves and they were going back to the tech companies. So then we decided to leverage our community and say like, can you bring us inside your campuses? And then that's how then we pivoted and we went for full B2B corporate food service vending through our initial crowd of moms at Parks. And then we ended and were able to get into Google, LinkedIn, Meta, and all of these companies. And still today, we're mostly a B2B company. But it started back there in in that part. It's it's amazing. And But when you pivot, it's like you decided to... Did you leave the small chains completely to go to B2B or you left a little bit here and concentrate on the B2B? So for a while, we were still in the retailers. Um, now, I think one of the things that you just say was focusing. We noticed like what was going to help us reach our goal and our mission. Leave farmers out of poverty, therefore we need to move a lot of volume. So what channel are we going to move a lot of volume? And so then eventually we did, need, we did stop on the supermarkets and retail and just focus on B2B and growing that because that's the one that was creating that volume yeah. and the velocity. Uh, but see, this is a very important lesson for all the uh, inf- um, founders out there that sometimes it's better just to focus in one channel than trying to be everywhere. Yes. Yeah, we learned the hard way. There was a uh, a moment that we decided, okay, let's go to these. We reached to direct to consumer right after you know COVID, um, and we realized that our our team was being stretched too thin, and we were not hitting any goals because we were not putting enough attention. And then when we decided to refocus, now we started growing like crazy. Okay, so let's go back to the minute that you decided. Okay, we realized that we want to start getting into these campuses. Yes. How did you reach that person? How did you pick up the phone and say, hey, I want to tell you this? Because how do you get people to talk to you on the phone? That's a, a yes. hard. So um, so as I go back to that community, I was like, okay, who, where does your husband work? Where do they? Because I knew their, my coffee was going to their house. And so I literally we started leveraging that community and be like, okay, you work at Meta, you work in so-and-so. Can you give us an intro to internally? Um, so eventually we kept asking our current community to give us intros, intros, intros until we find our way. It did took us nine months though to get to the right person the first time um, and just reaching out by emails. Okay, I'm, I'm, um, thank you for saying that because yeah. it takes time. And that's something that also, as a founder, I know that you have that anxiety in Mm -hmm. your chest and that you you have it when you have a team. And first of all, you feel like you're burning them out many times because we are doing so much and we're getting so little. So Mm -hmm. I, that anxiety as a founder, it's 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 there and it's real. (laughs) It's that pressure in your chest. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And and mostly if you're self-funded. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah, I always share that because people are like, oh, wow, you send nine emails for nine months every week to different people until someone responded. And it's like, yeah, it wasn't a month. It wasn't a overnight. Um, it was a process. But it was definitely just leveraging the existing community that we had to then pivot into a different segment. So you were basically targeting companies. And say, this is the vision that I have, and this is how the companies that I want to get in. Yes. Yeah. So what we did is that we knew we got our first uh, client in back then. um, And we're like, we're going to focus on this one, and we're going to make a successful um, just client, a successful. Yeah, a case study for you. Exactly. We went all out. I will say we even hit our mar- like our margins were really low because we wanted to put it all out there. We're like, if we make it that if we are able to show everybody that we're able to serve this whole corporation, then other doors will open. And with that, that's what we did. And so then other companies 
then opened the doors for us. And then now you just went rolling to other accounts. And remember, people move also from one company to another. Yeah. So it's yeah. great. Having a great success story and having a great uh, experience, it's something that it's a story that you can tell. Exactly. And, tell. Well, and actually, most of later on, our growth has been from people, from leveraging the internal communities, all the way from the baristas, from the account managers and so on, that they move and shift from other locations and maintaining those relationships that has opened the doors to other accounts. Absolutely. So what's next? It's to keep expanding or now you're thinking about opening another channel of distribution? So right now we're working in still expanding. We expanded our impact in Colombia. We're currently working with a community of 500 farmers that were lifting out of poverty. Um, and we do it through our adopt the farmer model. And so right now we're working on finding home to every single farmer because every com corporation we assign them farmers. And so that's what we're working on right now. It's still scaling. We are opening our first cafe um, in Palo Alto. Oh my God, you have my dream. I'm gonna have to come to Palo Alto, have a cafecito. Exactly. Uh, and so we we hope, you know, we wanna showcase our farmers and our story and how we present our coffee because it's really good. So people could experience outside of their corporate. Um, that would be a way for us to go into direct to consumer and kind of break a little bit outside of being just your coffee, your office coffee. Uh, but most of it right now, we're really focusing on that growth still to make sure we add more farmers into our, our platform. And see, I, I, what I love about your story and your brand is that I, there are so many brands out there that they think that giving back is going to be attracting more customers. And but is that is af after the sales. Yes. You know, if you if I sell, I give back, and I I personally have an issue with that because mm -hmm. I think you should be giving up all the time and yeah, you should exactly. be giving up from the beginning. Yes. Yeah, I know it. Mostly, you'll notice that it comes as an afterthought. Uh, with Progeny, you wanted to be, be build something that was sustainable, a sustainable coffee chain and circular economy. So one adds to the other one, and it's all embedded um, how it should be, right? A win-win situation. And it's not about charity because now we know, you know, you cannot just give more money because what will they do with that money? But with the support, training, we give them free occasion, technical support, and so on. So every bag you buy indirectly impacts. Yeah, and um, the thing is that you're making a difference. You're not just giving one time check that it will give a little bit. Exactly. You're, you're making the difference. You're giving these people more work. You're giving them housing. You're giving them something to live for and then to build a business and build a family and go generation by generation like you're doing yes. with the <laughs> uh, business of coffee. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that um, is really interesting that um, usually founders, they think that impact costs money. And what we re realized throughout the years is that, and we always say impact leads to quality. Our impact platform leads to a higher quality, leads for us to maintain our supply chain, uh, leads to more sales. So yes, there's an upfront, but once it's that sustainable, it has lower our cost, our margins, more efficient. And, and also you're getting allies. I mean, you you have each one of the farmers who is invested in giving you the best quality exactly. product that they, you can have. Yes, not so long ago, there was like a shortage of coffee in the world. There was like a 25% of shortage. Uh, and and the roasters here, our, our competitors were struggling to get coffee and we had our own coffee uh because we had our own farmers they're not struggling and so yeah so it's really beautiful to see like the whole right the whole very holistically how impact leads to just so many things i have a question for you now yes what does your family say now oh <laughs> well they're all very surprised because they never expected me to go back to farming <laughs> i always say i was like i'm i'm gonna go away <laughs> Uh, but the, right now they're very proud, uh, keeping a legacy. And I think most of all that uh, we're shifting uh, the communities back at home. Um, our, you know, we took our farm and we turned into an innovation farm. And one thing that happened recently was the government was going to remove all the helps for the coffee community in that area because they thought you couldn't grow great coffee. They came to our farm as a case study. And with that, 
uh, they were able to see that no coffee grows and we have new methods and therefore they were able to keep all the funding to all the other farmers. And so they're really proud to see now how this has trickled. Uh, and now my mom is one of the farmers. My dad works with me. My brother leads the impact. And so it's... I thought that was my next question because how do you control a company here and in Colombia where you have all these farmers, which is a big operation? Yes, yeah, no. So at the beginning we were trusting partners and we realized there was not a full transparency and things weren't going as we were expecting. And so now we have a we have a full-time team in Colombia. Uh, that is led by my brother Daniel, who he's an incredible farmer. I mean, he he did grow up being like, I am going to be a farmer, and that's where he specialized, and he loves it. He loves the farmers, and so you now we have a full time team that works all twenty four seven with them. That's amazing. So if you had to do it all over again, yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! First of all, would you do it? And second, what would you done differently? I know, and don't tell me oh, I wow. learn from each thing yes. that I did because I know that we all do. But yes. I know that if we will have that that piece of thing that is say, oh, yes. I knew this, I would have my life will be so much easier. Yes. So the honest uh, answer, yeah, yes, I will do it because now you see the impact, and I, just to see life transform, just it really moves me. I don't know if I will if COVID would have happened and I would be just doing anything else that didn't have that impact component, I think I would have, you know, just let it go. But what I would have done differently is I study design and for me always like the financials was always like an afterthought. Like I remember like at the university was like Excel classes and I'm like, oh, I'm not going to use Excel. <laughs> like I, uh, I'm just going to design. Um, and so I wish I had more that business acumen at the beginning, that financial, uh, how to do the, you know, p &L. I mean, now I, I do, but I feel like I made so many back then, uh, so many financial mistakes just because I just wasn't very financial savvy. Um, and later on throughout these years, I put myself into education, just learning and learning and, and making sure I yeah, you can up. never stop learning. Exactly. So I I will I wish I would have taken that step before and kind of like fully figure out like how do you do that PNL how do you get loans and the right financial structure did, did you have to get loans and did you have to get funding or did you raise capital by yourself how how do you raise fund, uh, capital yeah um, and at what stage so we were bootstrapped for a long time um, now. Once we start going to corporates, we did need to get access to capital because every account is a massive account. And so you need to bring containers and production team and scale and so on. Um, at that moment, we we got loans from CDFIs, which are nonprofits because regular banks wouldn't uh, lend us. You know, I, you know, I literally went to every single bank and every single bank closed the door. And so, but we figured out that there's these CDFIs, our nonprofits are here to lend to uh, minority BIPOC communities and they're just do it through uh, your potential, which is amazing. And still today, they're the ones that uh, loan us um, money, which is, they're called like uh, Opportunity Fund or Working Solutions, ICA, Pacific Community Ventures. Um, later on, we did raise money, so we already raised like about two million dollar, but we waited until That's from like, private capital or yeah, from VC funds, and so but we waited until our valuation was at certain point, uh, because we knew how much we how much we were willing to give up. Mm -hmm. um, so it was intentional the moment we went out and seek capital. Uh, before that, we just went fully bootstrapped or with you know lenders. What? My last question, I promise I let you go. Yeah. I already took a lot of time, but I am yeah. super excited. And I love that you're so open about this. And because you're helping a lot of entrepreneurs out there, because a lot of people think that when you get funding, that's it, you're set for life. <laughs> and I, I love your reaction and that you're going to start making tons of money. <laughs> yeah. Did your life change because you got the capital? or? Um. I mean, I think it does put your company in a different place, which is great. Um, it allows you to speed up some processes. 
Um, no, I wouldn't say it, it changed in the way, in the sense that like you still need to make the sales, right? Like you could burn $2 million. But you didn't become multimillionaire overnight. Yeah, yeah, no, like you still burn $2 million and end up in the same place. Um, what it changed was the pressure to succeed or the pressure to perform. That was what changed because when I just had my own loans and it was just us, I could sell or I could not sell. It was up to me and that's it. The moment you raise capital, then you do have VC funds that are looking at your p They want to make sure you're giving return, that you're growing a certain growth. And so I feel like more so you just need to be prepared to be at to that standard and operate at that standard. I, I'm so glad you mentioned that because I talked to a lot of founders that they're very early on, they're trying to uh, get raise capital and I, i'm very transparent normally i say unless someone really trusts you nobody will give you capital for your brand because mm -hmm. you have nothing to show yes they will yes. be putting money on you as a person not in the brand yet you need to have search reach a certain point to raise capital exactly and i think another uh thing that they don't realize is your valuation because depending on your valuation is how much capital can you raise you cannot raise a million dollar if you just have few cells right and also you know, you're going to be giving a part of your company away when you raise well, uh, when you're asking for money so you are in a better position to negotiate when you have a value to your company Exactly. I know. As I was uh, fundraising, I realized there was a point where I was like, oh my God, I am selling part of my company. Yeah. And also that was a big thing where um, we had a, a mentor um, and there was at the beginning a point where I felt like I was begging for money or like, or I would come in a place of disadvantage to the conversation just in the way I felt. I felt. Um, and then, you know, this coach was like, no, 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 you're selling them part of your company. Yeah. You're buying an opportunity that you could create for them. You're coming to bring more value and, and grow there, you know? And so that's another point that we don't realize. Yes. Uh, the value that they're looking at us, and that's why they are investing. Yeah. I mean, nobody's going to give you money if they don't think they're going to make money. Exactly. Yes. So I feel like to, to your question is, are you ready to take on that, you know, that that pressure of performing? And do you, and are you, do you have a path to perform and to be able to give that growth? And it's it's baby steps, I believe, when you're you're going to create a company. And what you say, and it's right to say, I learned from all my mistakes. I and everything I did brought me to the place that I am today, and I'm grateful for that. But also it prepares you. You have to have that journey as a company, as a person. And even when you think, for example, I always compare my, my agency. I say that I've been in business that I won't for as long that I, if I would be in human years, I wouldn't be in kindergarten yet. Oh my gosh, yes. So, you know, my I started Progeny when my daughter was three months old. And she's now eight years old. So every time, like I think about our business, I just see my daughter is like, "That's that's yes, that's progeny." <laughs> exactly. So yeah. that, that's that's what you need to think and take it to, with time. Don't expect because I, you don't expect a five years old to be doing exactly. college things. Yes, so you need and if your journey as an entrepreneur is only five years, there's only so much you're learning, and then when you are. And I keep learning all the time and bookkeeping and accounting. There's only no new things that nobody prepares us for. Exactly. You don't realize that you need to learn about HR, about employment laws, uh, 401k. How do you set up 401k? How do you say health insurance for your employees? Um, and like all those things that you don't realize that you're going to end up wearing so many hats from sales to HR to accounting. Yeah. Yeah. That that's well. I'm so glad that we keep learning and yes. we are open to that because that keep learning is the only way to keep growing. Exactly. Yeah, I feel like as, yeah. As we, I, we say to our kids, you have to go to school because that's where and keep learning. So one day you can ha have a future in whatever you want to do. You need to learn skills. It happens the same as being an entrepreneur. Exactly. Right now, um, I'm doing an MBA and. 
they were like what are you doing why are you even like you already have two kids you already have you know a family a, a, a business but you know I feel like as the company keeps growing like my skill needs to keep growing to be able to match it up else I will never want to be the blocker of my business or the bottleneck because my capacities or skills or to need to bring someone else because I am not up to that challenge I agree 100 percent with you yeah Maria, thank you so, so much for having coffee with me and to be so open and honest about growing a coffee business and in any business in that case. No, thank you so much for this conversation. And to you guys, I will see you next week with more coffee number five. Find everything you need at larashmoisman.com or in the episode notes right below. Don't forget to subscribe. It was so good to have you here today. See you next time. Catch you on the flip side. Ciao, ciao. What I love about the beauty industries is that there is always room to grow. I love to learn more about innovation, possibilities of investment, and partnerships across the industries. If you want to learn more, join me at Beauty Connect this November 6th to 8th in Los Angeles.